Hello and welcome to Elder Interviews, a program from Creation Spirituality Communities, where we explore the lives and experiences of our Creation Spirituality elders, women and men whose spirits shine with the hard-won wisdom of age. My name is John Robinson. I'm delighted to be your host today. And it's also my great pleasure to introduce Penny Andrews, who will conduct our interview. Penny is a 2001 UCS grad, a teacher, social worker, and chaplain by trade. She now focuses on permaculture, fermentation, gardening, and grandchildren on her 10 acres in Wisconsin. She is a speaker at the last Free Thought Church in the United States. Additionally, she does workshops on integrating the universe story into our lives through Brian Swim's Powers of the Universe. In a moment, Penny will introduce our distinguished guest, Barbara Susan Booth. But before we begin, I should explain our format. Our interview will run approximately 45 minutes, followed by a brief question and answer session. So save your questions and comments until we open the floor for everyone to participate. We conduct interviews on the third Thursday of the month, beginning at the same time, one Pacific, three Eastern. Check the CSC website for future interviews, which will include the wonderful Howard Hanger, at the CSC conference, Sacred Earth, Sacred Work in Asheville at the end of the month. Howard Hanger is the founder of an interfaith church, Jubilee Community, a great jazz musician, and a high-energy person you cannot afford to miss. Anyway, back to our program. Our interviews are also recorded and archived on the CSC website for all to enjoy later on. So with no further ado, here is Penny Andrews to introduce Barbara Susan Booth. Well, what a privilege it is to introduce someone who I consider one of my sacred, sacred friends from UCS. We were synchronistic roomies at the Y there, and uh, it just blossomed from that point as we did, pro did our own process groups all the time. Barbara is, uh, has an MA in psychology and a demon. And she's focused her life work on promoting the love of learning, the love of creativity, and the love of intuitive wisdom. She's the founder and director of Sacred Wisdom Center in Guelph, Canada, which is about an hour from Toronto, a place that gathered people together to share the deeper meaning of what is sacred. At the Sacred Wisdom Center, Barbara welcomed a stream of outstanding speakers, including Matthew Fox. She graduated from UCS in 2001. Her dissertation was on the emergence of the conscious feminine. In 2008, she completed training with Marion Woodman Foundation and taught for a year with a team in California, serving on the board of directors for that foundation. She's worked at, as a soul collage facilitator and remains connected to the Jesuit community where she studied spiritual direction. Well, it is such a pleasure to um, be spending the next 45 minutes engaged with you on what life has been uh, unfolding since UCS. Barb, uh, would you like to share your reading with us as a way to begin and enter in your your particular um, brilliant flower uh, flowering of UC, of creation spirituality. Okay, Penny. It feels so nice just to be able to talk to you in your own house again. <laughs> I like it. So I um, talked with Penny earlier and realized that I have one um, poem or reflection that's been on my website with Sacred Wisdom Center the whole time. And it's the only one. So this, this means a lot to me. And um, it was written about 50 years ago by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And this is what it says. One of the great problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have been usually contrasted as opposites. So that, the, so that love is identified with the resignation of power and power with the denial of love. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive 
and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. Ah, do you like it? Where are mm. you? Beautiful, beautiful. Yes. And can you say um, why that quote? I'm having to your life. Penny, yes. your, your uh, internet is slowing down I have, here. You can't I have a stable. Oh. I heard the question. I'm okay. Oh, okay. I can answer. I, I can answer. Um, um, Penny asked, how, why did I pick this quote and why is it so important to me after all these years? And, and it's an old quote. Um, and I constantly read and why would I keep coming mm -hmm. back to this particular one? Well, I think it says a lot from every angle I can think of about social justice, about correcting everything that stands against love. The last line is the key for me. Um, it seems in way back 50 years ago, the whole idea of relationship was that love was supposed to be um, the woman's idea of being um, sentimental and gentle and accepting. And the ma men's um, image 50 years ago was power and strength and bravado. And I think this particular quote says what's been true all along, that neither of those cultural stereotypes matter and, or are they real. The real truth is for all of us, male and female, can we stand up for what really matters? Can we correct things that stand against love? And I think it's the question I'm still asking myself now after all these years, even though I, I've looked at that poem for at least 11 years, and I'm still challenged by it. So not only does it invite me to stand up for what matters, but it says what I intended to do in my business is to bring people that would care about social justice and that would help us be aware of the power of love and their love in particular. So. I can't hear anybody. I think Penny has disappeared into the um, internet world. Okay. Uh, I think she's disappeared from us. So well, we can add lib. I like I liked her I liked her otherworldly voice. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so uh, how has that played out in uh, your life or how how does this look different to you now in this age and stage of life than it looked when you got your when you first got your degree? Well, um, when, I came, when I came out of um, UCS, a whole lot of new things opened up for me, like I know it opened up for a whole lot of people. The idea that we could um, explore more creatively than, than I'd ever had in my life, that I could value equally the creative aspect compared to the academic and cognitive aspect. And I think um, without UCS, I would not have had the experience of the diversity that I, I now expect. And I think it relates to the idea of power and love. It never occurred to me before I went to UCS that an academic institution would value creative expression equally to cognitive competence. Well, I never heard that before. And, and um, Matt's um, remarkable pedagogy opened the door to me for that. So what I loved to do was create, but what I thought was work was the academic learning part and the essay writing. It turned out that only together did it really make any difference and did it really, um, did it really come of any value mm -hmm. to put the two together. So the love and the power needed to be together to make a difference at UCS and in the whole rest of starting my business. Mm -hmm. 
what uh, what brought you to Matt? Did you address that while I was off no. on a walkabout? No, 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 no. I didn't. I didn't address that. Well, this is sort of an interesting story. Um, I, I, this it must have been like over twenty five years ago now or something that I, I went to England one time to London, and um, with my dad actually and. I went to St. James Piccadilly, which is a, a church downtown in Piccadilly Square, and I wanted to go and hear um, a speaker. So it was in the, it was in the evening, so I, um, I heard Dermot O'Murkew, by the way, and then I looked around at the information at the back of the classroom, and I saw these audio cassettes on, of Matthew Fox. And I was ecstatic. I thought, I've heard of him. I want to hear what he has to say. So I bought a couple of them and brought them home to Canada and listened to them all. And um, it, it turned out that the following year, I had um, a leave of abs. Uh, it's, it's called a deferred salary leave in Canada, where you work for a school board. And you can take a whole year off if you accept, say, two-thirds of your salary for the first year, the second year, and then your year off, you get two thirds of your salary. So I did that. I took the year off, had two thirds of my salary so I could travel and explore. And I wanted to find Matt. I wanted to go, one of the things I really wanted to do was to take some courses from Matt, but I couldn't find him. I, I went online. I didn't know. I mean, I kept getting holy names. I didn't, there was nothing in the um, search engines then that would tell me how to get to, um, University of Creation Spirituality, or even what the name of it is. So I, um, I decided, well, I have to go and see him. So maybe I better just phone him. And I tried to phone, you know, his regular phone, but of course, yeah, I couldn't. It was an unlisted number. So I thought, oh, well, I guess I'm not supposed to go. And it took about two weeks after that, that a friend of mine in Canada came to me and said, I just came back from UCS. I hear you've been looking how to go. So I actually phoned instantly and signed up to begin the program that within a month of finding him. Huh. So that's a very odd uh, track to get to a, a major opportunity for me. Uh, uh, before we go, well, they, that, that is how things happen, though, when they're real. Uh, I, I just want to interrupt Penny just to say, uh, excuse me, Robert, I think there's something, something about your microphone or your headset that makes the sound of your owl uh, that um, still come through. I wonder if you could experiment to see if maybe you could pull out your, uh, your, um, your micro headset for a while until, until it's time for questions can you hear it otherwise because we are getting your okay thank you sorry sorry thanks so <clears throat> i know that um it was a very um pregnant time at ucs and i remember also a conversation we had about what we were going to do afterwards with the transformative education we shared and what what did you do and does it feel in alignment with what you thought you were going to do well i i didn't do it right away um i i completed a few other things first like i had to finish working my my basic job was um a school psychologist so i worked for um a big Board of Education, and I had to complete that um, before I could be retired and then do whatever I wanted, which was um, retire and start Sacred Wisdom Center. So my, my passion was to bring these great speakers that I was so privileged to learn from in California, to bring them to Canada, so that um, the people I knew here and the creative interested people didn't have to fly everywhere to get to see these wonderful people and um also stop a carbon footprint if one person could fly and 30 people could come and hear the person so i always wanted to somehow find a way to bring 
the people that I loved listening to and learning from to Canada. And that's what I ended up doing when I started Sacred Wisdom Center. But when I left you, Penny, at the last of our DMIN program, I didn't know the wherewithal of that. I just knew the global idea of that's what I wanted to do. So in addition to Sacred Wisdom Center, I know pilgrimages have been very much a part of your spiritual journey. And can you say a little bit about what those what those were like for you okay well actually they're probably one of the most fun things i can think of doing is going on a pilgrimage and they're not all like serious and weight and eternity they're sort of fun too i was telling penny yesterday that um when the pilgrimages that i went to um, involved getting to know the people on the in the group too which was very precious to me so pilgrimages I've always wanted to go on pilgrimages and done my own so I've I've before I even went to UCS I I went to Fintorn and spent a couple of weeks in Fintorn um, learning um, about the land and working on the land and I did one course called um, the mythic landscape of Scotland and it was taught by a musician and a storyteller and what we did was we went into the mythic areas of the Scottish countryside and meditated and wrote and heard poems and so it was a real blessing and I learned um, circle dances and and the significance of relating to the land in a way that it was a cooperative effort to grow the the um, plants and seeds the first week going to Fintorn you have to work in what they call an experience week so I worked in the gardens and you know um, planted and raked and all that and I absolutely loved it and what I learned there was it doesn't have to be all day like we only worked three hours and we took a break in the middle so it was very um, respectful of our energy, the way they um, offered the opportunity there. So I, I learned about pacing and I learned about loving ordinary things. We, we also built a path, our whole class that, that week, we built a path that went into the um, center out of, you know, just stones the way you do it the old way. So that was just one opportunity that I uh, took way before I went to um, UCS. Um, so after um, I went on three, I've, I've been to Scotland and I, again. Um, I, I went to um, Iona for a week last summer with uh, John Philip Newell's program, um, Celtic Consciousness. And it's an amazing opportunity to learn to get back to the land, to respect women like um, the Celts did, and to respect the land in a way that you, you actually walk on it. And we went on a pilgrimage there, an actual walking pilgrimage in Iona as part of the retreat in Iona in Scotland. So I've, I've also been to Ireland and done the usual Irish trip. But this particular one in Ireland took me to Newgrange. And Newgrange is a passage grave that's, I think, 25,000 years old or something. And it's a, it's a cairn with a path um, leading into a stone circular sanctuary where on the 21st of December every year, the sun comes up and lights an image in the circular room. And the image is the, three, the triple spiral. So I use that as, the, as a, a way to do my dissertation at UCS. I took the triple spiral and I made it downstairs in my basement as a labyrinth. And so I walked it every day as I was writing. So the energy of this triple spiral, which was sacred, feminine, how it, it would kind of inspire me. So that was another thing. I went with Wisdom University, had some pilgrimages too. And I went to France for two weeks with 
Andrew Harvey in um, Apila, Colorado. And I, I went, that was a Black Madonna and Mary Magdalene. And that was an amazing pilgrimage. I went to Turkey for two weeks. Um, and that was a wonderful experience. And, and I went to Greece for one week uh, with um, Raymond Moody. And he's an expert in Greek spiritual places. And he would teach us and while we were there in the, in the actual location. So many of these last three pilgrimages, I went with people I met at UCS. They were in the group as well. Like, like Joanna Trulson and Lynn <laughs> are, are you frozen? Me? Yeah, now you're back. Okay. And I don't, I have unstable videos, so it may be me. That's okay. I think I'm. <laughs> I think good to I'm, me. It's okay with me. That's good to me. Okay, good. Um, so related to these travels that all seem to be related to the sacred, many of them to things related to the sacred feminine, it, it takes us into your work with Marion Woodman and you, and can you say a bit about Marion's influence on you and how you took her work into the world? Okay. And, and does anybody not know Marion Woodman? Perhaps we introduce Marion too, a little bit. Okay, Who I can do that. Okay, Marion um, uh, lives in Canada, she's Canadian. She's a very famous Jungian analyst who did a lot of her work in California, actually. Um, that's where her archives are now, too. She, um, she's written many books. She's known for her work with anorexia and bulimia and the sacred feminine. So she, um, as a young girl, oh, well, I guess not girl. She, when she finished teacher's college, she was maybe early 20s, maybe late teens. She went up to Northern Canada and taught in a, a school up there. And um, she loves drama. And she was teaching English and drama because she always believed that when you embody the work that you do, you learn it more deeply. So with her own um, high school classes, she always taught them plays and they would all be in the play in the whole school, not in the whole class. I mean, not just the little group that would do it as a special project after school. Her English classes involved being in the play. So she um, became anorexic when she was up in Northern Ontario. And she started to study that, the whole issue of anorexia, anorexia, bulimia and um, obesity as two sides of the coin. So she worked um, in private practice. Oh, oh, first of all, she left teaching to go to Zurich as an adult to be um, a Jungian analyst, to train in, in Switzerland to be a Jungian analyst. Her husband is a university professor and he was um, had a, a, a sabbatical in England. So she was there and met, she had her own Jungian analyst. And, um, and so, and then she studied in, in Zurich and finally finished that program and came back and was a Jungian analyst in Toronto in private practice. Then she started this program called Body Soul Rhythms, basically because she um, has learned already in drama and and the exercises with, with her students, that all of us need to embody the work that we're learning, much like um, Matt um, taught us with, um, you know, body prayer, for example, or the afternoon programs where we had movement. So um, the, the idea is that if you move, you learn more and you learn better and your body knows the, the picture. Now she was unusual as a Jungian analyst because they weren't talking body in that, those days. She was, you know, had to kind of convince others that her work was solid. Now it's famous and um, she was ahead of her time. So, and her, my, her relationship with me 
Um, I studied with her, this program lasted about seven years. And we studied um, the academic part. She used the lectures from the Nietzsche seminars, which are 1930s seminars that Jung taught his, his students that were going to be Jungian analysts. So she taught us the Jungian background through, through discussion of that book and the series of that. And then there was a whole series of experiential work where she worked with dreams, she worked with um, uh, movement, body movement, uh, specifically with two other partners who worked with her. Uh, Mary Hamilton it was dance and movement and, and Skinner voice. So we, they were to, all of them were giving us opportunities to learn through, and, and through art because we made masks and, and did drawing and art after every experiential exercise with the body. So it was a little bit like Matt, actually, with a combination of the academic and the creative expression. So we did that. And for me, Marion's main um, draw to me was Marion, um, Marion came from a family who, whose mother wasn't particularly nourishing emotionally. Uh, Marion had two younger brothers who both became, one became a Jungian analyst too. I don't know what the other one did, but um, she wanted to do something with for women. So I found my, my own background, I didn't experience a particularly nourishing maternal uh, environment. So it seemed when I went to work with Marion, there were so many of us that needed the mother. And so Marion was the perfect one. She was loving and gentle, but firm. She wasn't, I mean, she was a good mother. She wasn't gonna put up with nonsense if you were just not making sense. I liked her a lot, well, you can tell. She, Marion was the very first speaker that I had at Sacred Wisdom Center. And, and it was like unheard of that somebody that famous, like ordinary me in Guelph could bring this famous woman. And, and then Andrew, Harvey, he wanted to meet her. So they worked together for the very first Sacred Wisdom Center thing that I did. Oh. You've, you've branched off and done book groups. Can you say a little bit in, about what those looked like? Sure. Um, I, it's, I love doing these book groups. My, I have a friend here, a friend and colleague, who's a United Church minister. His name is John Lawson. And John and I uh, were working, we're too much working independently. And we wanted to do a shared um, collaborative something or other. So we, um, we both like learning. So we found some amazing books that we really wanted to learn. But we wanted to learn them along with offering the, a, a challenge and facilitating role to other people. So we, um, we have a local bookstore in Guelph called The Bookshelf, and upstairs from it, it has a little pub, and it has a movie theater, and a bookstore, and a meeting room. So they, because it was about books, they offered us the opportunity to work there without having to pay for the space. And so we, we have about six to eight people every time, and we found books that we just loved. And John and I would plan um, a way to introduce the conversation on that particular book each time. And each book had about six sessions. I'll tell you the book, just a couple of them so you get the idea. Well, Karen Armstrong came to Guelph once. I didn't bring her. And uh, her book, 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life, became sort of a bestseller in Guelph after she talked. So John and I decided to run a six session discussion group about this book. And then I became fascinated with Cynthia Bourgeau. So we read Wisdom, Wisdom's Way of know, Knowing and Wisdom Jesus, and then talked about it. And I could tell you the others, but yeah. maybe you don't need a whole list. We did 10 altogether, 10, 10 different wow. books, 10 different meetings over five years. And brought people together that wouldn't have necessarily no. come together yeah. And some of them said, 
we we don't like our church anymore so we sort of call you a replacement church <laughs> rather than going to nothing your inspiration has been about bringing people together now that sacred sacred wisdom center is is retired how do you have that nourishment in your life and how oh well um one of the one of the last things that i um uh one of the speakers or teachers that I last brought was this guy from England. Um, uh, called, his name is Regan O'Callaghan, and he uh, he's a um, an Anglican priest in London, England, who's who was born in New Zealand from a Maori mother and a Roman Catholic dad, and he ended up in England as an artist priest. And what his his um, gift is. He, he taught, as one of his arts, he teaches how to paint icons. Mm -hmm. So three years ago, I brought him, he was coming anyway to a church in our area, but nobody was as keen a, about painting icons as I was. So the church just said, well, if you're so keen, why don't you organize it? So I thought that was a perfect idea because I loved organizing things then. And so he came and I made one icon and then worked hard to get him back. We became friends. And so I still keep in touch with him. So he came back last summer and he did another week course and he stayed for two weeks this time. And he taught me how to prepare the, the boards for painting icons in the traditional way with, with wood and rabbit skin glue and cloth and a certain kind of marble dust and stuff that you make the coatings so 12 coats and then you paint the icons so um so i got fascinated with that and and since sacred wisdom center is over which was just december 2017 i've been painting icons like mad i mm. love it i'm just really enchanted i mean that's just one thing i do a whole lot of other things but it's one of my favorites because it's the creative aspect that Matt so often was encouraging us to value. Now I've got time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it sound, the process sounds like art is meditation too. You, it absolutely is. Yeah. Absolutely, Penny. It's, it is art is meditation. It's, and it's not an art form per se, it's a devotion per se. So like sometimes we, well not, yeah, well, most of the time, we, we start with a prayer. I often do it with one or two other people. We start with a prayer, work in silence most of the time, or some chat in the background. So we do it as devotion. And you get very attached to the, your, your art. Do you want to see one? Do you want to yes. see one? Yeah. I'll just go. I'm just walking over here, but I'm going to bring one to the... I don't know how to turn the thing. This is what I was doing yesterday. No. I got to bring it. I don't know. This one I just did. Can you see it? Can you see Beautiful. it? Beautiful. Yes. Okay. Lovely. That's the kind of thing I've been I've been fascinated with and doing. Okay. It's not as hmm. that all the other ones are women, but that's the one I was just working on yesterday. Okay. And is it from a traditional um, Greek? Image? Yeah, that, this one, um, Regan thought this one came from a, a church in Rome. I don't know. You can go online and, um, you know, Google searches and find the images that you want and do what draws you. And then as you Wonderful. paint them, you get more connected to the image. And icon painting is different from regular painting because you start with the dark first and the lighter colors come after. It's like the image is coming from see a cave or in from the darkness and coming forward so you're relating to the image more personally as it approaches you and as you get into the painting it's fascinating I, i've been teaching a few people around here because i love it and you teach that's teach one it. of the things you do i do i like that you um 
you have a remarkable youth about you and an, and also resilience and can you we're almost out of our first segment but can you say something about how your spirituality has informed that aspect of you which is you know just just always um ready for the adventure of life i mean it it sounds like what you said about your mother um it's always been part of you but is there anything that's come along that has informed that aspect of you that particularly is a rich well today well one thing is this icon painting is one rich well of spiritual depth i also you know i i have a whole armful so i like to listen to deepak chopra and i like to listen to his meditations I'm right now I'm listening to an old, old one called Desire and Destiny. And it's an easy thing to listen to. And I just love it. And I can, I've listened to it about five times. I mean, it's, there's um, 21 sessions, but I find it delightful and easy. Um, so that's a spiritual thing that I like. Um, also, you know, people are kind of amazed at all these things I've been doing, but I still love old fashioned things. Um, most people don't that I know. But I love the old-fashioned Catholic Mass. And when I, I was in Rome, and I, there's some here that I can go to, because I've connected with um, Loyola House, which is our Ignatius, Ignatian Jesuit Center's, you know, chapel and stuff. But I've had a lot of my um, speakers um, and events there. So they've got to know me really well. And I just sort of feel like I belong there somehow. I mean, nothing makes sense. It's all unfolding not predictable well thank you so much for this glimpse into uh oh my internet's unstable but this glimpse into your world and how you have profoundly gifted your community with your spiritual insights and vision and i'll turn it over to john now thanks penny Okay. Now, oh, I'm muted. I'm, now I'm muted. Now I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Oh, that's wonderful. Barbara. What what kinds of questions or comments do people have for Susan that from for this? Barbara. Uh, you got to get I'm, me right, Barbara. I got a. Well, I thought that was your middle name. Okay, Barbara, Susan Booth. Okay, Barbara. Yeah, Barbara. Yeah. Barbara's the right one. Whoops! Somebody's ringing. What's well, so I have a question for you, Barbara. H how is aging changing your consciousness? I mean, I, I love your work with icons, and, and that might be part of it. How do icons change your actual experience of, of being and, and being conscious? Um, I don't know what being older is. Like, I don't know <laughs> what, I don't know how to answer uh, being a elder means uh -huh. like I never it never kind of came through yet that I was an elder so, <laughs> okay so I don't know I don't know I just feel like I'm happy because now that I'm retired retired even from sacred wisdom center I have like a whole ream of Saturdays ahead of me mm -hmm. and I feel like a kid I don't feel older I just feel happier uh -huh. So. That's wonderful. That's, that's, that's a great answer. Other questions, comments? If you can raise your hand, because we have a lot of background noise, we'll be able to hear that question and the answer better if I keep everybody else on mute. So, okay, Thomas. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you can hear me now? Okay. So, in your icon drawing that you showed, um, why did you mix the straight lines with the uh, circular lines? Well, the, it's an actual, I, like icons aren't as, um, the traditional icons are copies rather than, um, um, 
creative your own designs okay so what i'm doing at this stage is i'm learning the techniques of this old art by copying some ancient images so they it's i fell in love with this image and the whole image rather than designed it so i was very very drawn to this particular one i found it about a year ago made a little card so that i could keep it with me and then the other day i was cleaning out my basement and found this paper i scrunched up opened it up and found this image on the other side that i didn't even know i had one down there so i i started doing it um out the the image is still speaking to me like the the, the work isn't finished but the meaning of it is growing and i i don't know why there's all these birds i know there's 12 birds but something's happening as i work with it that i don't have a full understanding of yet that would be fair to say it's it's growing into a an experience for me it's more than a piece of art that i should say well that sounds like fun yeah it is you'd like it other comments or thoughts questions how are you moved by what she said am i moved well yeah you're so on but how, how are you moved by what she has shared um i can see how that would i can see how that would happen if you would see something and then try and replicate it and, and, and get into the piece and feel as if you were the person you know that uh, designed that or something mm -hmm. I, I can understand mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and i just love her wait song. just That's wait till you do it yeah Okay. Where, where might we where might we learn to do it? Well, you you can get books. There's books okay. on this ancient technique, okay. and you can look in your um, in your area. Go on you know, Google, like everything. Mm -hmm. I tried to do a course in Cleveland two years ago, and there um, I went I went to Cleveland, but they weren't. They turned out to be not enough people signed up for that icon painting course, so they had to cancel it. But I did go to the museum in Cleveland and look at the icons. They're absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful. So when you go looking, you'll you'll find them. This well, technique is different than the than the newer ones that use acrylic. This technique mm -hmm. is an ancient way of using egg tempera. Mm -hmm. So you actually mix with the egg yolk to make it uh, the powder of the pigments come alive. Mm -hmm. So it's an old technique. Which, which is what I like. I like the Book of Kells. Yes. Oh, that Amazing. Double, and that's the closest I can get to that. Yeah. Well, Greek. that's it. And, and that's the way it was done in this yeah. egg tempera and egg. Yeah. Hmm. So Carol Kirby has asked, uh, what, what is your work now? Work. <laughs> I just have play. <laughs> what is your play now? <laughs> I. Uh, I, what do I do? Well, um, I'm always learning, which I sort of think is play or I wouldn't do it. I, I'm, you know what I'm learning, Carol? For the first time, I've never, ever understood astrology. So I thought, I, you can't be grown up and not understand astrology, for heaven's sakes. So I took a course online with uh, Tarn, Richard Tarnas and Stanislav Grof. And I found that fascinating. And I have an, a friend here who's an astrologer, and she's teaching me bit by bit because I knew nothing. And it was a big gap. So mm. that's that, it, but it's play, you know? <laughs> we were, you know, we were schooled in the reinvention of work. And so you've already reinvented your work so many t times. And so I just wondered if you would call the, the work right now work meaning the expression of yourself or is learning or play as you say so yeah it is mm -hmm. all the best thank you you too <laughs> well if we have no further questions uh, gail well, i was wanting to ask you a question which will what if you considered your life a myth 
what what would the myth be? What what is what do you say your life is about in the long arc of it all, knowing that you still have maybe a third of it to go, but it's a different kind of third than the first two thirds. <clears throat> mm. What would you say? What's the story of Barbara Susan? Well, I know I know some of the archetypal themes, but to fit the actual whole story in, I don't know. But I, I'm really an adventurer. So when you get myths that have the person that um, can't wait to get out to the new thing and to explore and adventure, that's part of it. But most of the myths I know that do that are like male hero myths. So mm -hmm. I just can't think of one right this very minute that has the woman so excited about the new thing to learn and the new place to go and it's where I go is I'm trying to find what's sacred and what's sacred in the land, what's sacred in people and what's sacred through and through is where my draw is. Mm -hmm. So I would be an adventure into whatever's sacred. Mm -hmm. Does that do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, certainly in our, in the arc of our lives as we, as we, go down looking for, you know, what's ahead of us. Certainly it is an adventure into the sacred. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say that, yes. Mm. It's very nice. Yeah. Well, do you have any closing words for us, Barbara? Well, I, I, um, I appreciate being asked. It sort of surprised me that, you, that I would be asked to be on this because for one thing, you know, I was a student and you introduced all these teachers and for the other thing, I don't see myself as an elder, <laughs> even though I'm as old as all the ones that are. Um, I do want to say that um, through my work with, with Matt and with, um, you know, the whole UCS philosophy, it's been the most important thing to me that's, drew, that's drawn me to all the rest of my life. I've met the most interesting people. Um, I, I've had many of them to Canada. Um, Alexander Kovats has been here, Lauren Artris, Suzanne Darley, um, Andrew, Bruce Chilton, Matt Vox, Larry Edwards, Neil Douglas Klotz. They've all come to Guelph and Kaleo and Elise. I loved meeting them. So part of it for the joy for me is the gift of all the people I learned from there, but then to bring them here and get to know them as people, it's, it's been a true blessing to me. The, the quality of relationship that comes from these very, very fine people that stand up for what they believe and, and go forward to find really love in the world, like the poem I read at the beginning by Martin Luther King. That's the people that taught at UCS have the philosophy, and it's even more fun to get to know them as people as well. So thank you. Well, thank you for, for being with us. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and, and your life story with us. Um, before we stop, I should make one announcement, uh, which is that we have an exciting new feature to our Elder Interviews series, which will involve you, our listeners, who will be the guest, all of you. On June 21st, we invite you to share your Elder Wisdom. We'll pick a theme or question and invite you to run with it. So stay tuned for more information about that, uh, but save the date, June 21st, 2018, and you too will be the wise elder sharing your life with us. So Barbara, thank you again, and, and uh, thank you, Penny, and thank you everybody for coming, and until next time, to be continued. Yeah.